All right, I see the Zoom room is filling up. It is noon on Tuesday. It is time for the virtual speaker session. We have a, another fantastic topic to present to you today. We are joined by Ken Hickman. He's the director of Penn State's All Sports Museum. We will be talking to him about their current World War II display that they have and their um, all the great work that they're doing at the Penn State All Sports Museum. We look forward to sharing that with you in a couple minutes. As always, we encourage you to let us know who you are and where you're from. Uh, drop that information in the chat box. We will also open it up for questions towards the end of the presentation. If you wanna put your questions in the Q&A box, uh, go ahead and do that and I'll try to get to as many of those questions as I possibly can with Ken today. Again, thank you all for joining us this morning. We'll be getting started in just a minute with today's edition of the virtual speaker session. I see Lynn Marie DiCarlo from New Milford, New Jersey. Hello, Lynn. Welcome to the virtual speaker series. Again, like I mentioned, we have a great program lined up for you. We'll be getting started in just a minute or two. We have Ken Hickman with us, the director of Penn State's All Sports Museum. I see Bob, class of 69 and 71 meteorology, Kevin Grimes down in Columbia, South Carolina. South Carolina is well represented with Tim Rowe over on the other side of the state in Charleston. Good to see you both. Huntsville, Alabama represented as well. Bill Roberts joining us. Penn State Physics, 1965. Oh, and I see my good friend, George Henning, right here in State College joining us as well. Good to see you, George. And Bob and Margie out in Denver joining us. We are gonna get started here in just a moment. Good to see you as well, Karen. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom video window, and then clicking show subtitle. You may also customize your caption view by clicking the stream text link posted in the chat. We are streaming today's presentation and this live stream has been made possible through the gracious support of a donor and the fund for access ideas and audacious goals. Today's presentation will be archived and available on our website after the event. This afternoon, we welcome Ken Hickman, the director of Penn State's All Sports Museum. During the course of World War II, approximately 1,200 former Penn State student athletes entered the military. These men served in every branch of the service and in theaters around the globe. While the majority returned to tell their tale, 26 ultimately lost their lives in defense of our country. This talk will provide an overview of Penn State's All Sports Museum's upcoming exhibit on this topic, as well as highlight the accomplishments of individuals such as Major Frank Gleason, Lieutenant Colonel Jack Reichenbach, and First Lieutenant Roy Hanna, and many, many more. Our presenter today, Ken Hickman, has been the director of the Penn State All Sports Museum since 2006. He is a 1998 graduate of Penn State with majors in history and political science. He also holds a master's in history with a certificate in museum studies from the University of Delaware and an MS in Information and Library Sciences from Drexel University. Prior to returning to Penn State, he served as the Curator and Director of Development at the USS Constellation Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. He presently serves as the Chair of the Penn State's University Museum Consortium and has been a member of the National Committee's 
with the America Alliance of Museums and the American Association for State and Local History. Please join me in welcoming Ken Hickman to today's virtual speaker series. Ken, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Paul. It's, it's certainly great to be here today. Uh, we'll go ahead and get in the uh, screen shared and uh, get on our way. Um, you know, as Paul indicated, uh, the All Sports Museum has been con uh, conducting research into the activities of our former student athletes who served in World War II you know, for about not quite two years now. Um, the goal of the project is to open an exhibit on this topic uh, later this year. Uh, we were originally looking to have that open uh, next month, uh, but due to you know, COVID and furloughs and closures, you know, we're looking right now at probably either late November or early December. Um, some ways this may actually work a little bit better. It'll let, let us tie into uh, the 80th anniversary of uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, this is in many ways a follow on to the museum's uh, 2017 uh, award-winning exhibit, Field to Front, you know, which chronicled those athletes who served in World War I. Um, we were fortunate with that project and a big thank you to Paul's predecessors at the Alumni Association uh, that we had a book for that project, which provided a list of alumni who had served in the conflict. Um, from that, it was easy to identify the athletes. You know, the total number was about 210. Um, this project we knew was always going to be substantially larger. Uh, and we unfortunately didn't have uh, any kind of head start available like we did previously. Um, in order to generate a list of former student athletes you know, that served during the war, we needed to cross reference our varsity letter winner list against available pension records you know, for the relevant period. Um, in this case, about 1900 to 1945. You know, and from that list of about about 3,400 names, we were able to identify about 1,200 veterans, in which, of which about, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, of which 27 you know, were lost during the war to all causes. Um, I should point out you know, that the project only includes those who earned varsity letters before or during the war. Uh, it does not include those who came to Penn State uh, af you know, after the war on the GI Bill, you know, or had served and came to college you know, thereafter. Uh, we felt it was very important you know, that that Penn State connection exists you know, prior to 1945, you know, prior to you know, you know, service you know, during the conflict. Um, you can see a breakdown here of, you know, of the numbers. Um, I will can tell you that Penn Staters served in all branches and all theaters. Uh, some were in the service prior to Pearl Harbor and Obviously, Penn Staters were, were in the service through you know, BJ Day in 1945. Um, you could find them in the deserts of North Africa, you know, landing on the beaches of Normandy, you know, in the skies over the Pacific, uh, battling the Japanese on islands you know, you know, across the Pacific. And you could actually even find two who were working on the Manhattan Project, you know, which developed the atom bomb. Um, these were predominantly men who had attended Penn State in the mid to late 1930s and early 1940s, as well as a number who had left school to, you know, to enter the service. Uh, just a quick note on what Penn State looked like at the time. You know, the Penn State that these men had attended you know, had been growing slowly during the 1930s, despite you know, the, the Great Depression and the challenges that that brought forth. Um, annual enrollment had grown from about 4,500 in 1930 to about 6,700 a decade later. And this was all under the you know, guidance of, of President Ralph D. Hetzel. Uh, Penn State at the time offered 11 varsity sports. Um, I should point out that you know, this was a point in time when we did not offer athletic scholarships. You know, this was a, a purity period um, that I'd be happy to come back and you know, you know, talk about you know, you know, at a uh, later date. You know, certainly if, if uh, rationale behind abolishing scholarships in the late 20s is, is fascinating to look at. Um, while football was enduring uh, middling results you know, due to this, um, a number of other sports at Penn State were certainly thriving. Um, this is a period that saw men's soccer go on a nine-year unbeaten run beginning in 1932. Um, so if I, if I give that a thought. Men's soccer didn't lose a game for almost a decade. Uh, the team in 1935 not only was undefeated, but did not concede a goal the entire season. 
Um, for those who were still in school you know, as World War II neared, um, there were a number of new issues that came up, you know, such, such as the nation's first peacetime draft in 1940. Um, this led a, a number of students to you know, elect to leave school in favor of voluntary enlistment. Um, others left to find uh, high paying jobs in defense industries. You know, there was a renewed focus on ROTC, which had largely fallen out of favor with the student body during the 1930s. And we also see the introduction of a variety of informal defense courses, you know, such as uh, marksmanship and first aid. Uh, Penn State commenced a series of engineering outreach programs to help train civilians to work in defense plants. And when the war did arrive, you know, Penn State would ultimately host a variety of military training programs, you know, such as the Navy and Marine Corps you know, B-12 program, uh, flight training, a uh, flight crew training for the Army Air Forces, as well as uh, the Army Specialized Training Program. You know, these were largely designed to help expedite the training of, of officers for the military. And I would point out that you know, all the participants in these programs, you know, regardless of how long or how short they were at Penn State were eligible to take part in varsity athletics. Um, Penn State's last five sport letterman, uh, Rowan Tubby Crawford, you know, you know, was a Marine Corps V-12 attendee you know, who lettered in football, track, baseball, boxing, and hockey, you know, all within a year. Uh, you know, these programs started to wind down in 1944 as the military you know, developed their own internal programs and as the war started to you know, move towards its conclusion. Um, while Penn State student athletes you know, achieved a wide variety of incredibly noteworthy accomplishments during the war, you know, there are three that I'd like to highlight in the short time we have today. Uh, the first of these you know, is uh, you know, Captain Roy Hanna, Jr. Uh, Hanna was you know, from not, actually not too far away. You know, he grew up outside Lock Haven, you know, came to Penn State in 1935 and very quickly was a member of Coach Leo Houck's boxing team. And within short order, it was one of the stalwarts on that squad. You know, he first lettered in 1938. You know, he claimed third place at the Eastern Intercollegiate Boxing Championships you know, that year. You know, a year later, as the team's captain, he won the title at 135 pounds. You know, he graduated in 1939 and entered the dairy industry, but he was also serving in the National Guard. In February, 19, excuse me, February 1941, um, Hannah had his National Guard you know, commission activated. Um, he was called to active duty, and when he completed his his training, he elected to volunteer for the newly uh, newly created Airborne, and he earned his jump wings with the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment, which was one of the U.S. Army's first airborne formations. Uh, you know, the following year, in uh, 1943, you know, he shipped out you know, with that regiment and the, as part of the 82nd Airborne you know, for North Africa. And you know, he made his first combat jump you know, into Sicily on July 10, 1943. And despite all of the training, you know, fate is what it is. Um, he had a couple, a very humorous story about you know, with his first jump, you know, he soon found himself hanging from a tree in Sicily. Um, he was, you know, was able to cut himself free, you know, was able to gather his men, you know, but he actually spent most of his time you know, during that first operation just trying to find his men. You know, the uh, airborne operations were very new. Um, there was a great deal of confusion. You know, the drop you know, had led to them being scattered. Um, while his campaign in Sicily proved a bit anticlimactic, um, the fall was a bit more difficult. Um, you know, part of the 82nd Airborne, Hannah included, you know, were brought ashore by landing craft this time on September 11th during the invasion of Italy. And for the next two months, you know, he and his men spent their time you know, fighting the Germans in the hills north of Salerno. Now, in early 1944, uh, with the Allied advance in Italy stalled you know, near Monte Cassino, you know, <clears throat> you know, their commanders made a decision to land forces behind you know, the enemy lines at a, at a town you know, called Anzio. You know, the 504th, having earned a reputation as being incredibly hard fighters, was selected to be part of that amphibious assault. 
Um, coming ashore on January 22nd, 44, um, Hannah again saw intense action, you know, which culminated you know, early the next month on February 8th. Um, in fighting near Carasito, north of Anzio, uh, Hannah took command of one of the 504th companies and was ordered to move forward and you know, to relieve pressure on other parts of, of the regiment. You know, as Hannah you know, led his company forward, a German bullet struck him in the upper right chest, you know, passing through the right lung and exiting through his back. Um, he continued to direct his men until he passed out from oxygen starvation. Um, he later related that he came to and continued with the mission until passing out again. You know, this process occurred multiple times until his company withdrew and he was, he was taken to a hospital. Uh, Hannah was evacuated from Anzio and flown to England to recover. And for his heroism on February 8th, he was awarded the, the Distinguished Service Cross, you know, which is our nation's second highest award for valor. Um, he was able to recover from his wounds and rejoin the regiment you know, in time to take part in Operation Market Garden that fall. Uh, this was an operation designed to capture several key bridges in the Netherlands. And it called for three Allied airborne divisions you know, to be dropped behind enemy lines. Uh, for Hannah and the 82nd Airborne, you know, their mission was the capture of the bridge over the River Wall in Nijmegen. And on September 20th, after three days of uh, fighting, Hannah took part in, in a famed am amphibious assault across the river that saw the 504th use canvas boats to take the north end of the bridge. Um, if anybody's ever seen the movie A Bridge Too Far, you know, I think it was Robert Redford leading that attack, but you know, Roy Hanna was you know, you know, part of that, that mission. Um, Hanna later fought at the Battle of the Bulge and the final advance into Germany until returning home in 1945. Um, in 2017, he was honored when the 504th Regimental Room at Fort Bragg was named in his honor. And a year later, he was a member of the inaugural class of the 82nd Airborne's Hall of Fame. And just prior to his death in 2019, he received the Military Order of William you know, from the Dutch government. <clears throat> yeah. you know, you know, our, next, uh, our next individual, I think someone had a question about whether or not any wrestlers had you know, did anything of particular note. And you know, this, you know, you know, here's the answer to that. Um, Major Frank Leeson. Uh, it was the son of a mining inspector. You know, and he arrived in State College in 1937. He had grown up in Northeastern PA and soon was one of the stars on Coach Charlie Spidel's wrestling team, as well as a brother at Phi Kappa Psi. And that actually becomes you know, an important part of, of his story. Um, he excelled at, at 136 pounds and claimed the Eastern Intercollegiate title as a sophomore. Um, he went undefeated the following season, but was not able you know, to uh, defend that you know, crown you know, when it came to uh, you know, the intercollegiate meet. And as a senior, he served as the captain of the wrestling team, in, in which he took to a seven and one record while placing third at NCAAs. Now, when the US entered World War II, uh, shortly after Gleason graduated in 41, you know, he had his ROTC commission activated. You know, the following spring, while he was serving with the Corps of Engineers in Washington, D.C., he received a phone call from one of his fraternity brothers, uh, Charlie M. Parkin, you know, who was working with the Office of Strategic Services, you know, which was the precursor you know, today's, you know, to today's CIA. Um, aware that Gleason had grown up in a mining community and had some familiarity with explosives, you know, Parkin recruited Gleason to come to Area B in Western Maryland's Catoctin Mountain Park to aid in training operatives and demolitions. Uh, there, he was known for his uh, infectious enthusiasm and he spent much of the next year teaching American and allied agents to create what he termed, quote, big booms. In early 1943, you know, Gleason received word that he was going to be part of an OSS team destined to establish training camps in China. Um, he arrived in uh, Kunming in July and with his superior officer, later traveled to Luoyang where they commenced building a camp you know, to train the Chinese in demolitions. Um, he did this for the remainder of the year and in 1944 received command of his own base in China near Kuai Lin. 
In the fall of 1944, uh, he earned fame leading a detachment that played a key role in halting a Japanese offensive. Over the span of about four months, Gleason directed the, direct, the destruction of over 150 bridges, 36 river ferries, as well as countless railroad locomotives and cars. And for these efforts received the Legion of Merit. Um, Gleason's exploits in China were relayed to a wider audience by Time Magazine reporter Theodore White. Uh, White had encountered Gleason in November 1944, and in addition to stories in Time Magazine, White chronicled Gleason's activities in a nonfiction account of the campaign entitled Thunder Out of China. Um, this in turn provided the basis for White's 1958 novel, The Mountain Road, with Gleason inspiring the main char character, Major Baldwin. Um, two years later, The Mountain Road was made into a feature film with fellow Pennsylvanian Jimmy Stewart in the starring role. And so not too bad to have Jimmy Stewart play, you, know, play you in the movie. You know, so. uh, after serving in both Korea and Vietnam, Gleason retired from the army in 1971. In 2018, just prior to his death, was one of several OSS veterans you know, to receive a Congressional Gold Medal in recognition of their efforts during World War II. You know, the, the last fellow you know, that we'll take a look at, and I know, I think the folks at the Alumni Association will be you know, particularly interested in this fellow's story. You know, we, you know, we always talk about how as Penn Staters, we encounter fellow alumni in the strangest places, whether on vacation, you know, traveling, business, what have you. Um, in April, 1945, Jack Reichenbach, it took that whole phenomenon to a much higher level. Um, Reichenbach had been born to a Jewish family up in Bradford, PA in 1915. It came to Penn State in 1934 and was a brother at Beta Sigma Rho, as well as a three-year letter winner on the basketball team. Now, he played guard and was known for his, his quote, long arching swishers. Uh, his senior year, you know, he helped the Nittany Lions to a 13 and five record while serving as president of, you know, of his fraternity. And he actually played independent league based basketball while working at the family business you know, after graduating. Uh, interested in aviation, he got his pilot's license in 1941 and quickly found this skill put to you know, a different purpose the following spring. Um, he entered the US Army Air Forces, earned his Air Force wings at Ellington Field in February, 1942. Uh, the next year saw him serve as an instructor in Florida and South Carolina you know, before receiving orders to head to Italy to serve as the operations officer for the 451st, excuse me, 451st bomb group. Um, while there, he later assumed command of the 722nd Bombardment Squadron you know, with the rank of major. On February 7th, 1945, he was serving as the aerial commander for the 451st Bomb Group you know, for a raid on an oil refinery in, in Kornelbrau, Austria. Um, during the approach to the target, a flak shell exploded under the nose of his B-24, killing two crew members you know, causing the aircraft to lose altitude. Uh, so he and the aircraft's pilot, uh, First Lieutenant you know, Jerry Naylor, were able to re uh, regain control of the aircraft. Um, the damage did prove fatal and the surviving members of the crew were forced to bail out over Hungary. Um, landing, the survivors were soon captured you know, by the Hungarian authorities and Reichenbach was singled out for being Jewish. Um, at that point, the you know, members of his crew quickly surrounded him and yelled at the Hungarians that they were all Americans, which worked to help defuse the situation. Uh, with the war in Europe, uh, entering its final months, you know, Reichenbach was initially her, uh, held at a POW camp outside Nuremberg before being transferred to Stalag Luft 7A in, in Moosburg, uh, Bavaria. Um, he arrived there in early April 1945, and he was su surprised to find that one of his fraternity brothers, uh, First Lieutenant Robert Rosenberg, it was quartered in the hut next to his. Uh, Rosenberg had been a POW since September 1943 when his B-17 had been shot down. 
Um, having reconnected Reichenberg and Rosenberg were further stunned on April 29th that when Allied forces liberated the camp, the first American officer that found the two of them was yet another fellow fraternity brother, you know, Captain Sidney Bergman. You know, despite the enormity of the conflict, the war had brought three Penn State fraternity brothers together in southeastern Bavaria. Uh, in the days that followed, you know, Bergman helped Reichenberg, excuse me, Reichenbach and Rosenberg contact their families and help provide additional food you know, while the two former POWs you know, were processed prior to returning to the United States. Um, departing the US Army Air Force in 1946, you know, Reichenbach remained an avid Penn State stater until his death in 2001. Uh, on informing his wife, Cecily, of his chance meeting you know, with his fraternity brothers, he fittingly wrote, quote, it's a small, strange world, isn't it, baby? Oh, um, <clears throat> Now, these are but a few of the individuals and stories that we will be highlighting as part of the upcoming exhibit, you know, as well as recognizing you know, the 27 former athletes you know, who were lost during the conflict. And you can see their names here. Um, I would also like to remind folks that you know, World War II history is all around us you know, when we're walking around campus. Um, two buildings immediately come to mind you know, that are named for the uh, individuals lost during the war. Um, the Garfield Thomas Water tunnel on Atherton Street you know, recognizes the bravery of uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade you know, Garfield Thomas, who was killed aboard at USS Boise you know, during the Battle of Cape Esperance in October 1942. Um, he had been a manager on the soccer team and posthumously received the Navy Cross for ensuring that his turret crew escaped after the ship was hit by a Japanese battleship. Um, Wagner Building, which houses Penn State's ROTC programs, it was named for Lieutenant Eddie Wagner, you know, who made the D-Day jump into Normandy with the 82nd Airborne and was you know, later killed by German artillery in, in uh, June 44. Um, also, uh, if you would like to see the complete list of you know, those individuals you know, you know, who made the ultimate sacrifice you know, during World War II, there are plaques in the lobby of Old Main you know, that do list those names. So, um, we're certainly looking forward to getting this exhibit you know, up and open to the public later this year. And we hope everybody will, will stop by to take a look. So, all right, I will go ahead and toss it back to you, Paul. Excellent, thanks, Ken. We have a couple questions coming in and that have been pre-submitted. If you have questions for Ken, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A tab on the bottom of your Zoom video window, or if you're watching on Facebook Live, go ahead and put them in the comments on Facebook, and we will try to get to as many of those as we possibly can. But first question from our friend Tom Foshnot. Tom is a, a wonderful advocate for Penn State veterans um, of all wars and of all services. Uh, but he asked, did you come across any ACEs? Uh, did you find, and did you find any aircraft that had Penn State markings? Not specifically as of yet. Um, there are a couple leads that we are looking into. Um, the, you know, the group that I'm particularly interested in tracking down, um, there are, were two groups of former students, uh, you know, and I, of which a couple of whom were former student athletes, um, that were tagged as the Flying Nittany Lions. Uh, they went, they were sent to Navy pre-flight uh, down in Pensacola, and we're working with the Naval Aviation Museum to try, down there to try to get a little more information about what may have happened to those two groups. Excellent. Um, a question here about uh, Whitey Von Nida from mm -hmm. Ephrata. I'm wondering if you found out any information uh, about Whitey. Um, and we certainly have. Um, I had the opportunity you know, to speak with Whitey back back in October, um, shortly before we were furloughed. Um, I um, am hoping if the vaccine and the COVID situation allows that we'll be able to get down there to do an oral history with him you know, within the next couple months. I certainly would like, I, I would absolutely love to get him on film you know, while he is still with us. And you know, obviously it's, you know, in talking about you know, the three fellows I talked about, if we'd done this project, you know, even 
you know, four years ago, you know, we would have been able to sit down with Frank Leeson or sit down with Roy Hanna. It's, it's alarming how many of these guys we lose, you know, every year, every month. Um, so we, yeah, we want to make sure, you know, that we're able to, you know, you know get Whitey you know, while we can, because he has a phenomenal story, uh, you know, both you know, in the Airborne and making the jump over the Rhine in spring 45. Absolutely. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Whitey was also the first Penn Stater to play in the National Basketball Association. Am I, am I right about that? Yeah, he, he is the oldest living NBA alum at the moment. Yeah, I had the opportunity to meet Whitey. Um, he is down uh, and is part of our Gray Lions uh, group, which is at a retirement home down in Elizabethtown. He, he's living down there. He is um, he's doing great. Uh, it was just a, an honor to yeah. meet with him and to hear his stories of playing in the NBA. Yeah, it's you know, like when we talk about, you know, how many of these guys are left, I mean, out of a list of about, you know, you know 1,200, um, there are about 11 or so who are still with us. Yeah, yeah so yeah. It's, it's a population we're, we're losing quickly. Someone else is asking about uh, Steve Suey uh, and uh, one of his fraternity <clears throat> brothers um, at Sigma Pi. Uh, any any information about Steve? Obviously, a, a big name in Penn State yeah. history. Um, you know, it's you know, Steve was with the the four uh, fortieth bomb squadron, uh, three nineteenth bomb group, uh, which served in Italy. Later, went to the Pacific. Um, you know, it, it, we've always had. I like to think think a very good relationship you know, with the Sui family, and you know, we'll be working with them you know, as we move forward, you know, to further develop you know, Steve's story. Because you know, it's you know, with the World War One exhibit we did a couple of years back. Uh, you know, obviously, Bob Higgins you know, was a big part of that story. Right. You know, and you know, the Higgins Sui clan is one of the first families of Penn State football. You know, so you know, you know, this is an opportunity to kind of continue that that story you know, right on through. Absolutely. Um, a question coming in from Dylan. He wants to know, will the upcoming exhibit in the All Sports Museum have artifacts that were sent to you by families uh, like the World War I exhibit did? Um, and what is the plan for, uh, what is the plan for uh, having that display and how can people take advantage of seeing the, the display once it's up? Sure. Um, yes, it, it'll be, you know, we've used a very similar process to what we used, used a couple of years back you know, with the World War I project. Uh, we were actually able to refine a lot of our research techniques um, you know, from that project to this project. And, and we are in the process of, of working with families to have photos come in, have uniform elements come in, you know, it, you know, and, and so forth. And so you'll be able to see, uh, you know, some similar items, you know, obviously just, you know, you know from World War II as opposed to World War I, but um, you know, the exhibit will be in our changing exhibition space, you know, at the All Sports Museum, you know, at Southwest Corner of Beaver Stadium, you know, you know once we're, uh, once we get it open uh, later this year. And, you know, we'll also look, I think, to try to develop an online component, you know, as well. Um. So a uh, question coming in from, from Bob Talia. Uh, Bob's uncle, Ed, was a Penn State baseball player before graduating and entering World War II as a second lieutenant. He was awarded a Purple Heart for his service at D-Day. Um, he went on to be a longtime high school baseball coach and professor. Uh, do we know if he's included in the, in the exhibit uh, and oh. will be included as the names listed? Um, you know, he, you know, he is, is. Um, you know, I've talked with, and you know, we've reached out to both of Ed's daughters, uh, one of whom you know, we've been working with on getting stories, photographs, you know, and so forth. Um, from that list of about 1,200 you know, I mentioned previously, you know, we, we've done further research on probably about 200 of that group, you know, either individuals who um, have a compelling story on their own or have a story that is representative of a certain type of experience. Um, you, know, you know, obviously Ed being part of the Normandy story, you know, was somebody that we wanted to make sure we covered. Um, I, he did have, uh, you know, his, the active part of his war was incredibly short. You know, he came ashore on, you know, uh, June 6, 1944 and was wounded June 8th. 
Um, right. Yeah, and was on was on limited duty you know, back in England uh, you know, after that at that point in time. Yeah, you know, but if, if that is a family we have talked to. Excellent. Uh, they will be, I'm sure, happy to hear that. Um, Chris Adams uh, wants you to re-mention the name of the five sport letterman. Could you please just share who that was again? And uh, were there any other five sport lettermen at Penn State? All right. Um, you know, the fellow in question is Rowan, you know, Tubby, you know, Crawford. Um, the previous five sport you know, letterman before him was uh, Steve, uh, Steve Hamas. Um, you know, and in both cases, you know, it, it, you know, they were helped by the fact that, uh, you know, like, well, Crawford's situation is, you know, it's wartime. Um, all, all of the V12, all the military program guys were eligible for varsity athletics. You know, so if they had the opportunity, if you could make a team, you could play. Um, you know, like you know, with Hamas, you know, I made mentioned before you know, that we you know, we were not offering scholarships, right? You know, you know, in in the late twenties, thirties, and forties, um, you know, so you know, we were you know, we were not recruiting athletes to those teams, and it's not to, you know, not to say that Steve Hamas is not a phenomenal athlete. He certainly was. He's an incredible boxer, um, but you know, it was also a point in time where. We were operating under more of the high, more of what we would consider a high school model, yeah, you know, you know where you know, the teams are built from the student body as opposed to recruiting from the outside. Right, there yeah, weren't yeah, the but, yeah. NCAA limitations on um, on number of years you could play. Right, there there were mm -hmm. it was a lot looser back then. Steve Hamas that you mentioned uh, was one of the student athletes that we featured in the Penn State or magazine when we listed mm -hmm. the top hundred athletes ever to participate in sports at Penn State. Steve was one of the top 100 that we have listed there for his prowess in boxing. Yeah. Um, so others wanna know when researching, uh, where is your best resource for information? How often do the families of these men, are they able to share uh, if any valuable information? Well, um, in terms of you know, your best sources, um, If, if you are researching within your family, um, the best place to start is generally with the National Archives. Um, if you put, if you go into Google or the search engine of your choice, put in something like um, like military records, uh, you'll be able to get to the, the correct page you know, through the you know, through the National Archives. Um, you know, we've been a little limited in going with that route in the last year. Um, because there have been limitations on what kind of records the National Personnel uh, Center, Personnel Records Center, St. Louis will pull. Um, just because of COVID, they're not staffed the way they ordinarily would be. Um, but in, in normal times, I would recommend folks start with them. Um, other options you know, always are, uh, to, if you use a service like ancestry.com, um, you know, it's a wonderful records aggregator. Um, a lot of the records that you can access through them are probably available elsewhere online. Um, but to be able to you know, put everything into one search you know, search uh, form and have everything pop up just saves a remarkable amount of time. Um, if your uh, family member is from Pennsylvania, uh, you will be able to pull their Pennsylvania pension records, you know, which you know, usually will give you some leads uh, you know, on, on where to go in terms of next steps. Great. Um, of the 27 that perished uh, during World War II, uh, are there any Penn Staters buried in Normandy? Um, I can tell you that Eddie Wagner, if for whom the Wagner building is named, you know, is, is, you know, is buried in Normandy. Um, I think he is the only one, but um, don't don't necessarily hold me to that. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, someone else is asking, are you the only one doing this research or do you have a team that's able to assist you? Um, I have done done a lot of it myself, but you know, we've, we've also used interns you know, to help out as well in the past. Um, you know, it's, you know, we've had a couple interns on this project. Uh, we had a uh, 
phenomenal intern who was with us. Oh, I want to say four semesters in one one form or another on the World War One project. Um, you know, he just got hooked on it and wanted to see it and you know, see it all the way through. Um, so yeah, we you know, we typically will work with the history department you know, you know, to find students who have an interest you know in these topics you know to come help us out. That's great. Um, Karen wants to know how long will the World War II exhibit be at the Sports Museum and when does it open? Um, you know, we're looking, you know, late this year, November or December for an opening. Uh, we typically will do a two year run on this type of exhibit. Um, that said, we're off of our usual exhibit calendar, you know, you know due to the last year. Um, so, you know, given the size on this, if we were to extend it to three, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, right. And beyond that, um, you know, we'll typically send elements of these types of exhibits out on the road to our Commonwealth campuses as well. Um, you know, for example, the World War I exhibit is currently stranded up at a Barron, uh, Barron campus you know, in Erie. <laughs> uh, and, and, that, and that had been to Harris, that had been to Harrisburg, Scranton, I think two weeks before we were supposed to bring it back from Barron, you know, things shut down. <laughs> That's great. Uh, what, what's next on the agenda? Uh, you've covered World War One, World War Two. Will you continue to cover Penn Staters um, in, in uh, service to our country or will you go in a different direction? Well, it's, you know, we have, you know, we try to do an exhibit plan you know, that works you know, a couple years out. You know, that way we, we sort of know what the roadmap looks like. Um, you know, we had a, a women's, uh, uh, women's sports history exhibit that we were going to open you know, back in July, you know, that we ended up indefinitely postponing you know, due to COVID. Um, I would wager you know, that's what we will look to do next. Um, you know, we've been, you know, some of the folks on our staff have been doing some uh, preliminary research, in, you know, particularly into the early, early days of women's athletics at Penn State. So you know, pre-varsity, you know, the varsity era starts in 64, 65. Uh, but you're know, taking a look at organizations like the Women's Athletic Association, you know, which started back in 21, uh, that later turned into the Women's Recreation Association. Um, you know, these were, you know, forms of, of uh, intramurals, but at times operated at a level, of, you, know, you know, that would be a bit higher than that. Right. Um, but it's, you know, I think there's some really fascinating stories here that you know, we're going to look forward to uh, digging, uh, digging into. Excellent. Well, Ken, we want to thank you for joining us today on the virtual speaker session. And thank you for allowing us to pass on the great work that you're doing at the All Sports Museum. We greatly oh, appreciate I, I, it. I appreciate it, Paul. Thank you. Absolutely. I want to thank all of you for joining us on today's virtual speaker session. As a reminder, we'll be hosting additional sessions in the coming weeks and months. And this programming is in addition to the wide array of online networking events and career programs that are available throughout the year. You can find the full listing on our website at alumni.psu.edu events. Thanks for joining us again. And as always, we are Penn State.